Hey geeks and geekettes, it's time for another edition of Ask Chuck Dixon 45. Um, let's go right to it. And thanks for all these questions. I've been getting some great questions. And uh, keep it up. Keep it up. Ashley Cronk 73. How did it feel to have your magnificent run? Oh, thank you. On Robin interrupted for issue 86 during the Officer Down crossover. Personally, I don't understand why they couldn't have reshuffled the stories. Personally, I found this irritating. It's very personal with you, and I appreciate that. I'm loving these videos. I hope you continue to make them. Well, that is my intention. I don't remember a lot about Officer Down, except that it was kind of a mess. <laughs> um, yeah, I don't, I don't remember a lot about it. <clears throat> but I can speak about crossovers. Um, you know, I, I was cool with crossovers. I mean, basically following death of Superman, we were trapped, uh, both DC and then eventually Marvel into this cycle of crossover events, uh, because, you know, they sold well, they were pretty much profitable or at least break even. And, uh, primarily retailers who comics are actually sold to, um, not consumers, it, retailers could understand uh, the crossover. If it was explained to them and it was compelling enough and the concept was high enough, uh, they could get excited and they knew which issues they had to buy and uh, could encourage readers to you know, buy comics they weren't used to buying because they were part of a crossover, you know, that kind of thing. Um, so, yeah, I was cool with them. They were just part of the business. But every once in a while... Uh, one would come along and it would throw a monkey wrench into, you know, plans that I had laid out. And I'm not the only one. Um, the problem was, and it was my own problem, is I worked so far ahead. I planned so far ahead on a book that sometimes I bumped into crossovers that would interrupt, um, you know, arcs or interrupt the continuity in what I was doing. Uh, and you know, that's fine. Like I said, crossovers were a nature of the business. They, that's what, that was the thing we were doing. Uh, you know, and, and DC still does the company wide crossover event. So, um, you know, because I worked so far ahead, uh, I was able to adjust. And an example of this would be, um, I, I had a four issue arc with Nightwing and Huntress. And um, it was kind of important to the overall storyline. It was the beginning of the, uh, the of a new year in continuity for Nightwing. Um, and, you know, I, I wanted to kick it off with a bang with this four-issue Huntress epic. And unfortunately, um, the uh, one million was going to fall in between parts one and two. Uh, so they alerted me to this and I said, well, hey, um, let me write a standalone issue and stick that in, in place of the first issue of this arc that bumps the whole arc past, uh, Nightwing 1 million and the 1 million crossover event. So I wrote issue 25. Now, Issue 25 wasn't even my idea. Uh, it was my idea to write a standalone issue. But my editor said, well, why don't you take this opportunity to write a character issue? And I'm like, well, what is that? And he goes, well, you never have your characters spend a lot of time talking to each other. They're usually fighting and running away or running toward or kicking or, you know, battling for survival or whatever. But you never have them just sit down and talk. <laughs> and readers love those kind of stories. Well, I wasn't convinced that readers love those kind of stories. I was convinced that the the uh, chronically geeky love those kind of stories. And that's, I've never aimed my stories at, you know, diehard comic book fans. I've always tried to aim my stories at the casual reader and hope that diehard comic book fans appreciated whatever I was doing. So my primary interest was in attracting new readers, uh, the casual reader, not the person who wants to see, you know, Dick Grayson and Tim Drake sitting around talking about what it's like to be Robin. Uh, but they talked me into it. And of course, you know, 
uh, Scott McDaniel was as ahead of schedule as I was. So he was able to, you know, come in and do this issue as well. And uh, it turned into a really good issue. And it's, it's, it's an issue that I sign a lot of copies of. It's a lot of people's favorite issue. But of course, it's filled with action because they don't sit around the Batcave talking about the old days and exploring their feelings. Uh, they're doing it blindfolded on the back of a speeding commuter train or freight train, freight train. And of course, they encounter a bunch of guys who hop aboard the train to rob stuff out of a boxcar, which a couple of months before I wrote this issue, I had read about it, it was an actual thing. Uh, thieves stealing from moving freight trains while those freight trains were highballing, while they were in motion. Pretty cool. Huh? That, that's right out of a comic book, and it was real. So I, I was looking for a place in Batman to stick that crime in, and, and, and you know, uh, Nightwing 25 was, was the way. And, uh, but, you know, the two of them got to have a meaningful conversation. <laughs> and, and a lot of readers, you know, a lot of readers dug it, which was cool. The, around the same month, I wrote uh, Night, uh, Birds of Prey number eight, which was another issue where they said, we, we want you to do an issue where Barbara Gordon and Dick Grayson explore their feelings. And, um, you know, but you don't have to write action. They can just talk. They could go for a long walk in Gotham Park. <laughs> and, of course, that wasn't happening. So I, I came up with the gag of um, Dick um, uh, taking Babs to the circus, letting her get on that trapeze one more time or one last time. So, uh, yeah, I mean, uh, crossovers were cool. Uh, some of them were better than others. One million was a mess, quite frankly. Uh, it kept changing. I don't know why. I think it was because of the editor. Uh, who blamed the writer, of course. But uh, the editor, I, I, I worked with the editor briefly, and I didn't like it because he was constantly asking for changes. I mean, you could write a 12-page story for him, and he'd ask for 100 changes. It was like the, 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 the script that never ended. And I think that's what happened with One Million. It was constantly being morphed and warped and wafted and batted about. And uh, it left a lot of writers, um, you know, adrift. <laughs> I was not the only writer who complained about one million, but you know, other than that, I was I was cool, you know, and I was cool with one million. At the end of it, I, I thought my one million issues were fun, even though sometimes I didn't quite understand what I was writing. So, anyhow, next question: Ben Baker, how involved in the creative process is the artist? Well, that all depends on the artists, and there's two kinds of relation. Actually, there's three kinds of relationship. There's the artist who fights you every step of the way, which I've never really run into, but I've heard about it. And uh, But mostly it's a marriage. Uh, you, you're, you both have the same goal. You both want to do quality work. Uh, and, uh, you know, but it's not as close as a marriage because generally I never hear from artists. You know, it's like a long distance relationship. It literally is a long distance relationship. But somehow rapports get built up. I mean, I worked with Jorge Zafino quite a bit. Neither one of us spoke each other's language. But we had a real rapport. I mean, a real rapport, and it happened on the comic page. Uh, Jorge had a way of um, seeing what I was going after, even when I wasn't clear from it, you know, clear in what I wanted, or, or where I was leaving a lot of it up to him and his extraordinary abilities. Uh, so I would leave a lot of stuff blank and... Um, or a lot of stuff, you know, uh, a lot of weight for him to carry, but he always did it. And he always did it in a way that astounded me and was always remarkably close to what I had in my head. You know, it's in part, it's hard to impart exactly what you have in your head in terms of, you know, mood, atmosphere, things like that. But, but uh, Jorge and I were always so often on the same page as the cliche goes. Um, Graham Nolan and I probably are the closest collaborators of anybody that I've ever worked with. Um, you know, because Graham is a writer as well. Um, you know, we've <clears throat> often collaborated. I'll, there'll be a bit more on that in another question, but, you know, we, um, you know, we get along well, we're brutally honest with each other, which is the only way you can collaborate. Uh, we, we let each other know exactly what's on our minds. And, um, you know, I, I, I know his strengths, he knows mine, and I believe we complement each other well. But, you know, he's the only artist that I worked with that routinely there would be a lot of back and forth, a lot of phone calls. And when we lived closer together, by that I mean we lived only a state away from each other, um, actually 
physically meeting with each other when it was a um, particularly uh, ambitious project, which I will get to in another question. You know, and then there's guys like Rodolfo DiMaggio, who, um, you know, Rodolfo, you know, you try to write to an artist's strengths. And I always ask a, a, an artist, you know, what what is it you like to draw? You know, if, if there's something you've always wanted to draw, you know, a story with a lot of horses in it, you know, or a story with a lot of weather, as Joe Kubert always liked, um, things like that. And, and Rodolfo said, um, I, I like to draw military helicopters. <laughs> it's like, boy, I want to work with you forever. <laughs> I mean, because generally uh, artists don't like to draw helicopters. I think the only thing they hate worse than helicopters are bicycles. Um, but uh, I mean, I, you know, I, I never wanted to have a bat copter, but I introduced one in Batman Predator 3 just so that uh, Rodolfo could draw a, uh, a chopper. And if you look over the, our Green Arrow run, there's a, there's a lot of helicopters in those stories because, hey, why not? Um, now, Flynn Henry, very, very dear friend, um, we had a strange collaborative process in that, uh, you know, we lived near each other. You know, we saw each other quite a bit, visited each other's, you know, on numerous, numerous, numerous occasions. Flint's apartment was kind of a, of a haven for geeks uh, for a while. And um, uh, we really didn't collaborate because he would draw whatever I wrote, but his art style inspired me to write the kind of stories I would have written. I would never have written for anybody else but him. So it was kind of a, you know, uh, yeah, this is yeah, it was a passive aggressive collaboration, and that's uh, that that's Flint. <laughs> passive aggressive, penciling madman. But, uh, you know, I would look at his sketchbook. I would look at stuff he was working on. And just stuff he would have on his shelves in his apartment would inspire me to write, you know, the kind of crazy stuff that, that he dug drawing. So so there you go. Collaboration. It's the soul of comic books. Um, because it's a raw medium. Because it's a guy writing and a guy drawing pictures. Or <laughs> one guy doing both. And it's all just done on a piece of paper or a Wacom tablet. And it's just words and pictures. And it's, it's, it's rock and roll, man. It's raw. It's immediate. And that's, that's what I love about it. Um, ben Baker follows up with, do they, meaning artists, have much input in the personality and background of the new character? Well, again, I'm back to, you know, me and Graham, um, um, Generally, the artist doesn't have a lot of input on the character uh, other than uh, when they portray a new character, it kind of informs the writer. Uh, so there is some degree of input. Um, the, the artist, when they create a new character, wants to know things about them so they can make sure that the character fits what the writer is asking for. Um, but Graham and I, have, I, I had deeper conversations with Graham about characterizations than with anybody else I ever worked with. Uh, one of our first uh, discussions or arguments uh, on Batman was, uh, I felt that Batman was a Protestant. I thought the Waynes were Protestants, you know, white Anglo-Saxon Protestants, uh, because they were an old family and old money. <clears throat> but Graham convinced me, because of the way that Bruce Wayne reacted to his parents' death, that, that the Waynes had to be Catholic. And he was, well, Graham can be quite persuasive. <laughs> <laughs> but but everything he said and, and and Graham is a Batman scholar uh, with with no equal uh, so all of his arguments made sense to me and I saw the characters in a new way and that's what collaboration is about it's about um, seeing you know the other creators point of view and trying to come to a middle ground but uh, in this case yeah Graham was 100% right uh, the way that Bruce Wayne reacted to his parents death basically driven by guilt um, to, you know, put on a crazy costume and go fight crime. Yeah, that's that's not a Protestant thing. No, no Lutheran was going to do that. Ben Baker, again, it's a Ben Baker triple spin, folks. If the artist called and said, I don't agree with what you have X character doing the script, would you change what you had written? Um, well, I was on a 
Batman title with an artist who will not be named. <laughs> and and this artist, who I loved working with, uh, had the very, very bad habit of not reading the entire script before he began work. So he would begin with page one and just draw page one. And then he would read page two and draw page two and read page three. This isn't as unusual as you might think. Um, I'm going to share a shocking detail with you is that most colorists never see a script, which is why you get coloring mistakes in scripts. Who, that it's not the colorist's fault. There's no way he can know this was supposed to be a nighttime scene or this scene was supposed to be in Caroscuro. Or the bad guy is supposed to be escaping in a red car, not a blue one, even though in the dialogue it says red, because he didn't see the dialogue, especially today with computer coloring. He doesn't see lettered pages at all. Another shocker for you is, is that a lot of letterers don't read the books. They can say, well, how, how can a letterer not read the book? They don't. They're lettering the words in front of, it, in front of them, <laughs> and they're not really reading it. I don't know how to explain this, but... You know, a letterer once told me there was a, a typo in lettering. It's a hand lettered typo. This is when hand lettering was done. Um, how can you have a hand lettered typo? How did you do that? He, he repeated a phrase twice inside of a word balloon. And he explained to me, he says, the phone rang in the middle of the balloon. And I went and answered it. And I had in my head the next couple of words I was going to letter. And when I sat back down, I lettered them. And I never looked back. <laughs> So there you go. But um, yeah, what was the question again? Yeah, phone just rang in my head. Uh, so yeah, um, yeah, literally, what was the question again? Yeah, the, okay, so anyway, I had this artist who uh, would read the script page by page. He wouldn't read the whole script. And he's about, four pages into a script and I introduce a new character and he says, well, why can't this character be a woman? And I said, well, you know, this, this character faces a pretty gruesome death before this story is over. And he says, no, you know, I want to, he was all about, uh, you know, diversity or something or equality or I don't know, equity. And, and he wanted this character to be a woman. Why couldn't the character be a woman? I said, well, there's no reason the character can't be a woman. I'm telling you, I know you're a little bit squeamish, and he was. Um, you know, he, you know. I, I went to the movies with him a couple of times, and, and this guy would, you know, do everything but hide his eyes during <laughs> violent sequences. Um, I said, you know, she, trust me, she faces a pretty gruesome death, and I don't know if you want to draw a woman, you know, getting killed in that way. Uh, that's why I wrote the character as a man. I didn't really want to kill a woman in the way that we're about to kill this character. And he said, no, I'm fine with it. I'm fine with it. No, I, it'll be fine. It'll be fine. Now, again, he could have read ahead in the script, but he didn't. When he got to those pages where she dies, he calls me again. And he says, well, I, I, you can't kill her this way. And I said, no, we have to kill her this way because she's killed. It's a theme villain. And this is how a villain kills people. So it, you know, and this is what this was in a comics code comic, so it was never not going to be that graphic. But I said, this is how this guy kills people. It's not he's not going to not kill someone this way and suddenly pick up an axe or or you know give her a dose of sleeping pills. This is this is it's in the character's name. This is how he kills people. So he he said, well, can't we rewrite? I said, no, we can't. And I said, then this is why you should read the whole script. <laughs> so that's really the only time I've ever had. Um, an artist asked for a change in a character and uh, I, and I did what he wanted <laughs> and he still wasn't happy, but now I, I love the guy. I loved working with him, but you know, every once in a while you, you hit a hiccup like that. Remy Wilkins says, I have a, what if comic question, if you could start your own comic company, selecting any five established characters from any company, who would you select and why? Well, number one would be Commandi, the last boy on Earth, because it's one of the rare comic book characters, like the Flash, you know, the world's fastest, the fastest man alive. Okay, the concept is in the title. His name is Commandi, and he's the last boy on Earth. Um, and I think that Commandi is a character that they don't exploit enough at DC. I mean, this is just a, a marvelous concept, uh, especially for younger readers, um, you know, 
It's got the apocalyptic theme they seem to love. <laughs> and it's filled with talking animals. I mean, come on. Uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a comic that would appeal to boys and girls as well. And I think uh, DC misses the boat when they don't promote this more. Uh, I try to sell DC on allowing me to do a series of all-ages comics uh, based on Commandi. And uh, the first thing the editor said was, what would you change? And I said, nothing. I wouldn't change anything. What Kirby laid down was perfect. I said, the only alteration I would make is I would dramatize Commandi's introduction more than Kirby did. I would give it a little more breathing room. But, you know, Kirby was trying to get the concept down in the first few pages of the first issue. Plus, I think he created the book over a weekend to replace another book that had been canceled. You know, so he didn't want any interruption to his work schedule. He just, you know, came up with Commandi, this, this brilliant idea. But he didn't put a lot of thought into the intro, the intro story. And I said, that's the only thing I would change. But they didn't like that idea because they didn't like that audience. On the same vein, Spider-Girl. And for the same reasons, Spider-Girl uh, was a huge hit with young adult audiences, particularly girls, tweeny girls, when it was put into paperbacks and sold in bookstores. Um, it was a, a lot of a lot of comic fans don't know this, but Spider Girl was a was a phenomenal hit in trade paperback for Marvel at the time. Um, trade paperbacks of Spider Girl were selling what um, you know what more than a lot of individual comic books were selling at the time. These were trade paperback collections, you know, twelve fifteen bucks selling more than what at the time was you know a, a dollar or two fifty dollar two fifty comic book. Uh, and, you know, Tom DeFalco and Ron Friends had struck comic book gold here. But Marvel's attitude at the time was the same as DC's. They didn't, they didn't care about the young adult audience, and they didn't do much to keep the series going. Um, so I would, I would make Spider-Girl part of my, uh, because of the proven track record with a universal casual reader audience, I would, you know, I would bring her into the fold. Nightwing, for a lot of the same reasons, uh, I would do Commandi. Uh, Nightwing, uh, on Nightwing, we had a, a big female readership as well as a male readership. And uh, I wrote with that in mind. You know, uh, I wrote more complex stories because that's what female readers like. They like more um, heart, uh, more emotion into their stories. I was always conscious of that. And, uh, you know, but, you know, there was plenty of action for the guys. And the guys like the emotion and heart stuff, too. They just don't want to admit it. But Nightwing, I would make part of the fold. Plus, you know, hey, I got a, he, he's got a big place in my heart. What can I say? Space Ghost. I would do Space Ghost. Um, I, would, I would deepen the universe and broaden the character a little bit. Uh, he's Space Batman, and I would lean hard into that. I think Space Ghost has just a... I don't know, a basic fundamental appeal uh, that has never been fully explored. Uh, I mean, the cartoons were fun when I was a kid, but I always wanted more from them. Even when I was a kid, I imagined a broader world that Space Ghost lived in that was never seen in the cartoons. I just imagined that there was a whole lot more to this character than we were seeing on the, on the TV screen. And... Uh, it's, you know, again, another character with broad appeal uh, to a younger audience. And I think it would be great to do more with him. Archie Andrews. Archie Andrews is around and has been forever and will be. And he's got mass appeal. He sells in the supermarket rack. He's got a huge universal following. And I would make him part of, I would love to make him part of any comic line, imaginary comic line I was involved with. And uh, I would make the stories funny. <laughs> I want to see Archie be funny. And uh, he hasn't been funny for a long time. And funny is hard to write. But I wouldn't change anything again with Archie. I would, you know, maybe update it a little bit, but not too much. Uh, because that love triangle to uh, tweeny girls and, uh, you know, like kids under 12, they, it's, it's, you know, it's solid stuff. It's good stuff. And, uh, you know, I would make it part of my line in a perfect world of my imagination. <laughs> Thanks for that question, by the way. That was fun. Travis L.D. Murphy, could you please share any behind-the-scenes stories about your work on Joker's Devil's Advocate? Well, it's Chuck and Graham Day. 
uh, yeah, it was, um, <clears throat> we were working on detective and we were having the freaking time of our lives and we wanted to do a special project, uh, something that was more than just, you know, the monthly book. And, uh, we came up with this concept, um, the basic, con well, let me, we came up with the concept. We took it to Archie Goodwin and Archie liked it. And he proposed we do it as a hardcover. And we, we, Graham and I really wanted our own hardcover. We never had one. Uh, and we wanted one and we thought we earned one and we thought this was a cool idea. And so Archie gave us the go ahead and we did the Joker Devil's Advocate, which is our ultimate Joker story. Now, if you're not familiar with the Joker, uh, the Devil's Advocate, um, it's never really been reprinted. Um, <clears throat> It involves uh, the Joker is basically the Joker is accused of a crime he did not commit. Uh, he does a series of post office steam crimes. And when people turn up dead from licking poison postage stamps, uh, all evidence points to the Joker. It's kind of it's kind of his kind of thing, you know, killing people with postage stamps, you know, kind of weird jokery kind of deal. And uh, he's busted. And he's put on trial. And uh, the, uh, the hook is, is that Batman is not convinced he's guilty. And everybody tells Batman, well, look, you're nuts. You know, um, so what if he didn't do it? He, he's committed all these other crimes. He's killed all these other people. So what if he goes to the electric chair for a crime he didn't commit? You know, he'll be paying for all the ones he did commit. And uh, they put... They put Joker on trial, and at the time, the O.J. Simpson trial was going on, which kind of gave us grist for um, courtroom shenanigans. <laughs> and, uh, so, so while the Joker is on trial, Batman is investigating this this series of postage stamp murders, and he keeps visiting Joker in prison. And Joker isn't helping him at all. You know, he doesn't. You know, Batman, why is Batman going to help me? He's my greatest enemy. Uh, but Batman tries to convince him, look, I'm trying to help you out here. You know, if you can help me out with alibis or whatever, you know, Joker's not having it. He thinks Batman's just there to, you know, torment him when he can't get away. Uh, so eventually, you know, the Joker is convicted and slated to get the death penalty. And, uh, we had a lot of fun with that. We had a lot of fun with the Joker in prison as well. Uh, <laughs> and, uh, you know, it's, there's, you know, a lot of our signature humor in it and the rest of it. But the, but the thing is, is the, um, the fun of it was that the two of us got to collaborate on a Batman story in a way we never had before. And, um, we actually, you know, Graham was living in Buffalo, New York. I was living in, outside Philadelphia. And we, we went to New York and we actually, you know, met. We spent about three days sitting in a hotel room and, and sitting on a bench at Central Park taking notes. And we just worked the whole plot line out. Because if you read ever read the graphic novel, it's, it's, it's pretty complex. It's a pretty complex graphic novel. And, um, but, you know, we wanted to work everything out so that it was, a, you know, it's, it's basically a murder mystery story. And we wanted to have all the red herrings and, and the rest of it. And, um, it, it was quite a bit of work. It was, it was more intense than any other Batman story we had worked on outside of our Captain Fear story. And, um, it, it, it took two of us to write that story. That's all I can say. And, uh, as I said before, Graham is a writer in his own right, very, very good writer in his own right with a terrific story sense. So, you know, we had a good time and, um, the, um, the, the, the best part of the whole thing was, is, is that when we handed in the script, uh, Archie called both of us and said, he says, you got me. He says, you really surprised me with the resolution of the story. He said, I, 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 I thought I, I knew what was going to happen early on. And he says, you, you completely turned me around you completely. He says, I was absolutely surprised by the resolution of the mystery, which pleased Graham and I no end. Uh, now, 
the reason why a lot of you have never heard of this book was it was never really elevated to any kind of level of importance by DC. It was, it was mar had kind of lackluster marketing. It was kind of like, hey, those guys who do detective comics every month, well, they want you to spend 20 bucks on hardcover. <laughs> So it wasn't treated as special or as special as Graham and I thought it was. And consequently has never seen reprint, which is strange because Joker is probably more popular now than ever. And I would really like to see that thing appear again. I think it's worthy. Uh, we certainly put a lot of work into it. Um, a, a side note on it uh, is, you know, we were in New York for a few days uh, with some time to kill. And um, we were back in the hotel room. We're exhausted. Probably both have headaches from trying to figure this thing out. And Graham is looking at the newspaper and says, hey, they're showing Blazing Saddles at Radio City Music Hall. <laughs> and some of the writers are going to be there to introduce it and answer questions. So that's where we went. We had a, we had a blast. Standing room only at Radio City Music Hall, one night only showing of a uh, beautiful 35 millimeter print of blazing saddles. So it wasn't all work. Uh, Eric Valencia. Hey Chuck, I've been reading through your work with Scott Beatty, Nightwing, Robin and Batgirl year ones. How exactly does it work when both of you are writing an issue? Do you toss ideas back and forth and then one of you writes the dialogue? Um, yeah, Scott, Scott is, uh, Scott's an incredible writer. And uh, you know, boy, this is, this is the, the theme of this one is collaboration. And I never really even thought about that until I started reading these questions. Uh, yeah, Scott is, um, he, he, he's something, man. And he knows his DC continuity like nobody's business. And that's one of the ways that we complemented one another. Uh, I'll get into that a little bit in a minute. But um, for the most part, on the, on the year one books, and, and every time we wrote together, we wrote together quite a bit, um, we came up with the plot line. And in the year ones, you kind of know where you start, and you kind of know where you're going to end up. And um, we would, you know, come up with our basic plot line, come up with the subplots and the rest of it. And then one or the other of us would just start writing. And we kind of had a scene breakdown. Uh, we would have a scene breakdown worked out. But that was malleable. That was flexible. That could change if we came up with other ideas. And so, uh, you know, I would write a scene and then um, Scott would write the next one and I would write the next one. And, and then we would each do a write through and we would go back and, you know, make sure it all flowed. Like, so it didn't appear to be written by two different people. And also, you know, fix any dialogue glitches or get rid of any redundant dialogue that kind of thing. So each of us would do a write through and then we would, you know, you know, if there were change, further changes to be made, we talk about, it. but like with Graham, uh, Scott and I always play well together. We're brutally honest with each other and, uh, we enjoy the same things. We enjoy working with each other. And, um, so, you know, it was what I call an organic process. Um, now on back row year one, um, like I said, Scott, Scott's the, uh, the continuity king. He just knows DC continuity backwards and forwards. And he was always able to add in these little Easter eggs into all of our stories. Um, you know, sometimes in dialogue, sometimes in visuals. But I had an Easter egg in back row year one that I was really proud of. I was able to, you know, out geek the geek. <laughs> so, uh, <clears throat> in back row, uh, initial appearance at Detective Comics, her very first appearance, she goes to a costume party attended by um, Commissioner Gordon, Jim Gordon, her dad, goes to a costume party dressed as Batgirl and, and fights a bunch of criminals. Now, the backup in Detective at that time was the elongated man, Ralph and, and Sue Dibney. And uh, Ralph was the elongated man, sort of a plastic man knockoff. And um, in, in that same issue, Ralph and Sue also go to a costume party. And both stories are written by Gardner Fox. So he must have been on like a costume party fixation that month. And I kind of think the Batgirl story had to be written in a hurry because DC was informed by the uh, Batman TV producers that they were going to introduce Batgirl to the TV series. And they'd better hurry up and put a Batgirl into the comics uh, before the TV show appeared. So um, 
so I don't think Gardner Fox had a lot of time to think about it. He thought, well, I got this elongated man story at a costume party. Uh, yeah, Batgirl goes to a costume party. Well, here, the, here comes the geek in me. Uh, I thought, well, when we present that story in Batgirl Year One, I want to have Ralph and Sue in the background. So it's the same costume party. They went to the same costume party. Get it, get it, nudge, nudge, wink, wink. So that was my geek, big geeky uh, contribution to that. Now, Nightwing Year One um, really brings out the comic book nerd, the continuity uh, wonk in Scott, because we were basically bridging two eras from the, you know, Batman to the Teen Titans era. And, um, you know, I wasn't as familiar with that stuff as Scott was, and, and he brought a lot more to the party on that miniseries. Uh, but the thing is, the collaboration was so close that if you ask me, and I know if you ask Scott, who wrote this and who wrote that, we really can't remember. And it really was written by both of us. We both um, brought something to the party. And I, and I think the, the, um, the stories were better for us having collaborated on them. I really think, uh, you know, he's a great writer on his own. You can think about me what you want to think. Uh, but the two of us together made those things kind of special, I think, because, you know, we brought our own strengths. Okay. Um, <clears throat> I promised every once in a while to talk about my favorite authors. And some of you have said that you really enjoy those segments. So here's Ed McBain. Uh, Ed McBain was, um, the pseudonym uh, of a writer who also wrote under the name of even Hunter and, and several other pseudonyms. And, uh, but my favorite is his series of novels about the 87th precinct. Uh, these are police procedural novels and, um, he wrote a lot of them. He was prolific. Uh, I think he wrote like two or three a year for a long time. And, uh, it took me years to catch up with all of them. And then eventually I was reading them as they came out until, <clears throat> until he passed away. And um, the 87th Precinct takes place in a fictitious town of Isola. It's a big city. Could be New York, could be Chicago. It's kind of an amalgam of both. And, uh, and, it, and this leaves, because it's a fictitious city, it, it leaves him a lot of room, uh, a lot of artistic license, make these stories timeless. Uh, you can read the 87 Precinct novels written in the 50s, and they, they seem just as fresh as the ones he wrote in the 80s. Um, and it, it, I learned a lot about continuity from this guy uh, because he kept his continuity tight, really tight. And uh, his characters were indelible. He, he introduced characters like Steve Carella and, and his deaf mute wife, Teddy. And they're just indelible. Like for the first time you meet them and you picture them in your head. Uh, <clears throat> he was, you know, Cotton Halls and Burt Kling and Fat Alley Weeks and guys like that. Uh, Meyer Meyer. These characters just became, um, you know, like living things in your imagination. And he, he just never dropped a stitch. There's a consistency to these books. They're really solid po police procedural novels really solid mysteries, you know, lots of action, lots of heart, lots of suspense. And, um, you know, as a writer, you know, he had the, uh, the honor of working with two of the greatest filmmakers who ever lived. Uh, as even Hunter, he wrote the screenplay for the Hitchcock's The Birds. And uh, Akira Kurosawa adapted King's Ransom, one of the 87th Precinct novels, into the brilliant crime movie High and Low. Um, and there were other adaptations as well. Um, Fuzz is a teaming of <laughs> Burt Reynolds and Raquel Welsh. That is, uh, it's a pretty good ad adaptation of an 87th Precinct um, story. Um, Jack Weston as uh, Meyer Meyer was perfect casting. Uh, it's, it's got all the humor and it, it's not one of the best 87th Precinct stories, but it worked well as a movie. And, of course, there was a comic book series uh, based on a short-lived television series in the 60s. So, uh, yeah, Ed McBain. I mean, uh, if you ever get a chance to read any of them, and you don't have to read them in any particular order. I mean, they do refer back and forth to continuity of previous stories, but it's not enough to affect the story. They're all very much standalone. And um, 
if, if you like a good cop drama and you like uh, characters you can really get engaged with, you simply can't do better than Ed McBain's 87th Precinct novels. Um, in a previous video, it might have been the one just before this, somebody asked me about fame, being famous as a comic book writer, and I poo-pooed that, and talked about, you know, the peculiar brand of notoriety that a comic book creator has. And w one thing I forgot to mention was an incident where I was involved in a court case. It was a civil thing. I have yet to commit a felony. It was a civil thing, and I was, uh, you know, one of the participants. And it was in a small rural town with a magistrate. And uh, I get up on the witness stand, and my lawyer is, you know, giving a little background so everybody knows who I am. And he asked me what I do for a living, and I say I'm a writer. And he says, what do you write? And he says, I, I write comic books. Now the magistrate's interested, and he leans over to me and he says, would there be any that I've ever heard of? Did you ever write any comic characters I've ever heard of? And I said, well, currently I'm writing a lot of Batman. And the magistrate says, no, I never heard of that one. <laughs> so I knew right then and there I was going to lose that case. How did this guy ever not hear of the most popular comic book character in the world? But he didn't. That's how far out in the boonies we were. It's a wonder they had electricity. Uh, anyway, that's it for me this week. Um, I will see you again Wednesday morning <laughs> for, for you uh, folks that get up early to watch these. Um, but until then, if you like this video and you know people that would also enjoy, you know, this kind of inside baseball look at the creation of comic books, um, why don't you let them know? Why don't you share it on your Facebook, your Twitter, your WhatsApp, your Gab, uh, <laughs> your Mind, your MeWe, whatever other, uh, you know, social networking platform you're on. Uh, why don't you share them? Give them a link. Let them know. Give them a nudge. Say, hey, you know, this guy is, uh, you know, speaking the truth here on comics, you know, pouring his guts out every week on writing comics. Um, that would help me. It would help YouTube. It would, it would help other fans find something that they might possibly be interested in. So if you can spread the word and uh, it helps me to keep doing these, quite frankly, that's it. I'll see you all down the road.